Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's February 18th. It's time for more uh, Deep Space updates. We're about halfway through the month of February. We've had about half a dozen launches this month. I have been to Europe, which is why I haven't been making videos. I think I might have picked up a bit of a flu on the way, but let's get down to the launches. So on February 5th, Russia got their Proton back into the air after a, a bit of a hiatus. Proton M launched from Baikonur carrying an Electra L meteorology satellite to geostationary Earth orbit. So yeah, Proton is one of these sort of rockets that seems to be living out its days, uh, slowly uh, you know, winding down until they come up with uh, Angara or something as a replacement. 7th of February, there was a Falcon 9 carrying the Amazonas Nexus satellite to geostationary orbit. This is a communications satellite. It's replacing the Amazonas 2. Also on board is a high bandwidth protected communications transponder for U.S. Space Force called a Pathfinder 2. 9th of February saw the launch of a Soyuz rocket carrying Progress MS-22 to the International Space Station. It has already docked there and, well, it replaced MS-21, which in the last week sprung a leak in its coolant system. That spacecraft has since been disposed of, but the leak does mean that they have since delayed the planned replacement of Soyuz MS-22 with Soyuz MS-23. That was supposed to launch like next week or this weekend, but that has been pushed out to March. 10th of February saw the India Space Research Organization get their small satellite launch vehicle to space for the first time. This was a second launch attempt. And uh, yeah, they successfully carried the payload, which included the EOS 7 uh, Earth Observation Satellite, a Zadi satellite for Space Kids India, and a uh, Janus 1 from Antares. They uh, were all launched into a low-ish inclination 37 degree orbit. 12th of February saw SpaceX launch a Falcon 9 carrying a Starlink Gen 2. This was Group 5-4. It was 55 second generation satellites into 43 degree orbit. Most notable about this launch, this was the fastest turnaround they've had for a single pad. So they used Slick 40, the same that they used for the Amazonas Nexus launch. And so the turnaround time was something like five hours, sorry, five days, three hours and 38 minutes. Pretty impressive. Uh, and they would actually repeat this uh, just yesterday. They would get very close, less than six hours. But yes, uh, yesterday we had SpaceX launch a Starlink Group uh, 2-5. It was launching from Vandenberg this time. That meant 50-odd uh, satellites into a 70-degree orbit. Didn't get to see this because I was at a you know an event watch it, looking at aircraft that were getting built. But yeah, later that night on the East Coast, SpaceX launched Inmarsat into a geostationary Earth orbit from uh, Florida. And again, that was from Slick 40, so the turnaround time was less than six days. Very impressive work on SpaceX. Now, SpaceX, have, of course, have their other launch facility there, but they are currently getting ready for the launch of Crew-6, which will happen next weekend. The other big launch event of the last couple of weeks was Japan's H-3 rocket. This was supposed to be like an upgrade, or ultimately a replacement for their H-2. So uh, this got onto the pad, it was counting down, they lit the main engines and then they shut them down before firing the uh, solid rocket motors. So yeah, the vehicle's going to get rolled back to figure out exactly what went on, to do some further testing. The H3 uses a new LE9 engine and that's had a lot of teething problems. The LE9 uses what's called an expander bleed cycle. So the expander cycle is what makes the RL10 upper stage engine really efficient, where you basically power your turbo pump by heating up the hydrogen fuel, having it basically vaporize and using that pressure to drive a turbine. The problem is that can only scale to certain thrust levels before they just can't get enough heat out of the combustion chamber. So by doing, by instead of feeding the output from the turbo pump into the combustion chamber, you just bleed that overboard. That means you can put, get much higher mass flows and run like a booster engine off it. And that's what this is all about. But during the development, they've had problems with like a vibration, turbine flutter. And yeah, so it's, it's definitely a couple of years late. The payload for this launch was supposed to be the Advanced Land Observing Satellite 3, ALOS 3, three ton optical imaging satellite built by Mitsubishi Electric Corporation. Virgin Orbit finally had something to say about their uh, failed launch from the UK earlier this year. Their investigation found that a fuel filter uh, basically broke off somewhere in their second stage engine and that resulted to, it int interfered with the flow through the pumps meaning that the main of the second stage engine was getting less fuel than it should have 
And because of that, the, the temperatures were getting higher because the engine was running closer to a stoic metric. And uh, that ultimately caused some components to fail from overheating and, of course, the engine to shut down and fall back to Earth. Now, Virgin Galactic, on the other hand, they had a good week because they have White Knight 2 returning to flight after, you know, upgrades, modifications to, to make it ready to actually enter proper service. That flew from Mojave this week. I guess they chose the one day that wasn't absolutely wild. <laughs> Basically, I looked at the what somebody pointed out the weather in Mojave had winds of 50 knots gusting to 64, which means I could practically VTOL my plane if I, <laughs> if I judged it right. We now know the final two crew members of Axiom's AX2 space mission to the International Space Station. That will be Rayana Barnawi and Ali Arkani. So they are going to be part of this mission. Uh, they are from the Saudi Arabia. This was announced on February 12th. They're going to do experiments and stuff when they're up there. And, well, you know, it's cool that they've got a man and a woman doing this because, you know, up until like 2019, Saudi Arabia didn't even allow women to drive. Uh, which is good because this will mission will be driven by Peggy Whitson, who is working now as a commercial astronaut for Axiom Space. So other SpaceX-related news, I guess the big news was that Starship finally had a full-up engine test, and this happened while I was in Europe. Now, I was in Europe for a Kerbal Space Program 2 preview event. Basically, myself and a bunch of uh, you know, high-profile space people, a bunch of high-profile video game people, and then, of course, there's the space and gaming people, including myself, everyday astronaut, you know, Das from a NASA space flight, EJ, Matt, <laughs> like, like, so many people were there, and when we knew this was going to happen, and it just happened that it was during, like, a special dinner that was happening after the event, where we had got into the, we had basically had taken over this planetarium, and we had stars in the sky, and Kerbals bouncing around, and so we actually got them to play the the live stream from NASA Space Flight on this, uh, and so I think it's wonderful because we all got photos, we all got videos of us around this table reacting to this. Come on, is it counting down? Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I want you to take away from this is that we get very excited even if we aren't streaming to a live audience. We are just naturally excited about rockets. So yeah, this was a it was supposed to be a 33 engine test. In the end, one engine was removed just you know beforehand, and then one of them shut down before it completed its uh, fire. So it was 31 engines. They didn't run them at full throttle, so the total thrust was only about the same as a Saturn V. Only, right? Uh, having said that, it was a successful uh, test. They're obviously going to scale this up and go further out. Um, th as far as I hear, the FAA, as far as the FAA are concerned, SpaceX could launch in March if they if they are ready. Um, the other news from SpaceX was that they have sold their two oil platforms, which were called Phobos and Deimos. Remember, I was making jokes about a, you know multi-billionaire owning two uh, oil platforms named Fear and Dread, yeah. Um, so yeah, they've sold that, they've decided that they're not going to use those for offshore landing at this time because they're not really, you know, they would require too much conversion. They will probably come up with something else which is more bespoke and better suited to what Starship is doing. Um, over at NASA, uh, interesting little uh, outreach if, nugget is the Deep Space Network now, DSN now, that has gone offline for a security review. And this is, well, many questions are being asked about this. 
So um, DSN now is this cool little web page that you can go to and you can see what all the deep space network antennas are doing, right? What satellites and spacecraft in deep space are communicating with. And so it get taken offline and then the person that runs it basically, <coughs> basically explained that it had been taken offline for a review. And that does leave a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> because what is it? I don't think it's a way that I don't think it's a problem that it would let you hack the network. I think it's clearly giving out some information that somebody doesn't think should be public. I'm guessing that they're going to get the various APIs to make sure there's ways that they can insert or shut down or mask information. Because honestly, it's it's not it's not one of these things that uh, is is particularly sensitive when it's talking about uh, space missions. I mean, it was interesting that during like Artemis, they basically took over the deep space network, got a lot of communication from it, so much so that the James Webb Space Telescope had to cancel their plans because they needed too much bandwidth. So they had to switch over to observations that required much lower downlink rates. Uh, you know, that's how important the deep space network is. I have a video about this. Uh, they're looking for ways to upgrade it. Okay. Um, so yeah, SpaceX is Transporter 6 launch, if you remember, that was a few weeks ago. It carried a bunch of uh, satellite carriers, you know, space ferries with it. One of those was the debut launch of a uh, launcher's SN1. And they've now admitted that it, it has been a failure. After launch, it operated successfully. It was able to communicate, control attitude. However, it somehow couldn't control its attitude sufficiently to turn its solar panels to face the sun. So it eventually ran out of battery powers and power and was unable to deploy any of the satellites with it. And those, some of the satellites were themselves like carriers which carried multiple CubeSats, such as Alba Orbital. They had a CubeSat deployment on there. So, you know, it's becoming like Russian nesting dolls, right? Where you get the, the launcher, which launches the launcher, which launches the CubeSat deployer, which launches, yeah. You know where we're going. Okay, uh, Blue Origin. They actually have a contract from NASA for a new Glenn launch. So they are going to launch the Escapade spacecraft, which is the Escape and Plasma Dynamics, Di Plasma Acceleration and Dynamics Explorer, a pair of two satellites which are supposed to orbit Mars. Those were originally going to be launched on SpaceX Falcon 9 that was carrying Psyche. But at some point, they couldn't make the trajectory work, especially with the delay, so they get put onto their own launch vehicle. And... Interestingly, at, at that point, they needed more propulsion, so they worked with Rocket Lab, and apparently they're now using the photon buses from Rocket Lab, but it sounds like they're going to get launched on a new Glenn, and it's gonna, they're going to get launched for like $20 million. It's like a really low-ball cost, just so that NASA can get new Glenn as part of its launch uh, you know, capabilities. It's highly likely, given the cost, that there will be rideshare payloads available for this, but... You know, this is at some point in the future. We're not sure yet. Okay, so the other thing that we've had a lot of talk about the last few weeks, not quite space, balloons. Yeah, there's been a few more balloons shot down. And it's pretty clear that some of these are like kids' science experiments, which uh, may not be such a good way to, you know, use people's resources. But hey, um, have, having said that, you know, <laughs> people should really catalog these things a little better. Uh, but interestingly... You know, sort of in response to this, there's a bunch of groups that have shown that they can track like the 70 meter Chinese balloon using commercial satellite imagery. They were able to go into historic data that was generated by Planet Labs constellation and track it over various points in its flight. Worldview, if you remember, they were making a lot of noise about how they were going to do tourist fight flights into the stratosphere on uh, balloons. Well, they've started stressing that, by the way, they can also do commercial remote sensing you know, trying to really play on that. On the other hand, it's not been great for everyone. There's a Canadian company called Space Ride. They shut down, they declared bankruptcy because uh, they, well, they had planned to launch rockets from balloons. And the idea is, of course, you get it really high and you can get it to space with a lot less propellant. However, they ran into problems when they were testing their rocket engine and neighbors complained. Like they were in a rural area, not many people nearby, but you, you are firing a rocket engine that makes lots of noise. And uh, yeah, they eventually got shut down and they couldn't find a new facility, a new place before they ran out of money, investment money. So yeah, that's, that's gone. Now, so last weekend there was the Super Bowl. You know, sports fans from all over the world were watching the touchdowns. 
But asteroid watchers, they were preparing for the most spectacular touchdown. Yes, because hours beforehand, somebody had found an asteroid, about a one meter object, maybe about one ton, and it was on course to impact the Earth just around the, you know, the end of the, the <laughs> end of the game. Uh, and it was going to happen over Normandy in northern France. So this thing came down. People were prepared with video cameras to catch a meteorite they knew was going to happen. Um, so people from France, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, England, Wales, they all got images of this. And Germany as well, yeah. So that's great. And we've already had people go over to Normandy. They have found fragments of it. So this is going to be, this is amazing. This is one of the best studied uh, you know, meteorite events ever. So yeah, until so finally. Yes, I was over in the UK, in, in the Netherlands to uh, play Kerbal Space Program 2 for the first time. And I can't really tell you very much about it because there are embargoes. But I did get this rather fetching Valentina doll. Yes, love Valentina. She's now the star of things. So yeah, look, the game does work. I can confirm that. It is going to be coming out end of next week in early access. Uh, you know, so pay attention because there's going to be a lot of talk about this very important game uh, in the next week or so. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.